Good afternoon, good morning and good evening. My name is Joji Waits, the Head of Flight Safety at the British Pilots Association, and it's my great honour to welcome you to the first of what we hope will be many BALPA hosted events covering progressive safety topics. It's truly humbling to see so many people online from all over the world and from such a diverse range of organisations. Through these online gatherings, the pandemic has, if nothing else, helped bring the world closer together. Although the title of this conference contains the word airlines, the principles are relevant to all walks of life. So we're pleased to see so many professionals from outside the aviation industry, and we welcome your insights over the next two days and beyond. Whilst this is the first BALPA safety conference, it certainly is not the first of its kind, and we're indebted to those organizations and people, many of whom will be speaking here today and tomorrow, that have established a platform from which a nourishing safety dialogue can be had. We hope with this conference to build on the momentum already achieved by these great pioneers. There's a well-known phrase, words create worlds, and it's through sharing the language of safety to stimulate thoughts that we hope to inspire a transformation for many of you over the next two days. This conference will not provide the answers to your complex safety problems, nor would it be a training course on all things safety too, safety differently or safety new view, but hopefully it will provide enough intrigue for you to want to learn more. We hope to convey the benefits in seeing things from a system point of view, to appreciate complexity in our day-to-day -day work and to learn from all experiences and not just those that have gone wrong. At this point, I'd like to introduce and thank my co-host, James Bunnell, EasyJet captain and flight safety rep, has been a driving force in putting this conference together. James, would you like to just quickly say hello? Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. You know, it's been a pleasure to put this together. I'd just like to say thanks to all the uh, speakers who have kindly given up their time to uh, hopefully get us all started on this journey if we're not already on it. Thanks, Georgie. Terrific. Many thanks, James. And you'll, you'll be seeing more of James over the next two days. The conference is, uh, is split over two days. Um, today we'll start with an insight into some of the latest theories of safety and where they've come from before tempting you with a taste of how the theory can be applied in practice. This acts as a bridge into tomorrow, which will focus on tangible examples of practical application, uh, as well as the views of the safety regulators here in the UK. Each day we'll feature a panel Q&A session at the end where all of the speakers of the day will unite to answer your questions. This leads into a brief bit of housekeeping. Um, those familiar with Zoom will know there's a chat function available. Please use this to chat amongst yourselves uh, or to make general observations as we go along. However, for specific questions aimed at our speakers, please use the dedicated Q&A function. We really would appreciate your cooperation here as it will be much easier for us to track and collate your questions for the panel session later. So just to reiterate, questions will be taken in the panel session not after each presentation. Also to let you know that all sessions will be recorded um, and these recordings will be made available on the BALPA Safety Conference website later. Given the large number of people viewing online, um, we've had to mute and turn off cameras for those that are not speaking. And similarly, we'll, we'll ask the, uh, the panelists uh, to do the same when they're not speaking as well. Finally, uh, there will be a 15 minute rest break at roughly 3 p.m. UK time um, when this session ends and then there will be a brand new session um, to join after that break. So you haven't given up your valuable time, gotten up early in, in the morning or stayed up late at night to hear me go on. So we'll get on to the main event shortly. But just before that happens, um, I cannot end this introduction without expressing my gratitude to, to add to James, to the speakers for donating their time and wisdom that makes this conference possible. They're here because they've done extraordinary work improving safety, safety systems across the world um, in many ways, and none more so than our keynote speaker, one of the tree pioneers, Professor Eric Holnagel. So Eric um, is currently senior professor at Young Shopping University, Sweden, and a visiting professor fellow at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He has worked at universities, research centres and with industries in many countries and with many problems from many domains. Eric has published widely and is the author of the editor of 28 books, as well as many papers and book chapters. Over to you, Eric.
Eric, you, you, your sound is muted at the moment. I can't hear you at the moment, Eric. You might need to try replugging in your headphones, maybe. Can you hear me now? Got you. Okay. So, oh, okay. Maybe it's advanced. Technology, you know. Always quite. Okay, what I'll do, I'll start if I can figure out how to do, how to do that to share my screen. Uh, so you can see what I'm planning to talk about. And um, maybe this is not the best way to start a uh, two days discussing safety by uh, starting with this question, is safety really enough? But uh, that's what I want to talk about anyway. So here we go. I think it, it's sort of, sort of taken for granted without ever discussing it that the problem is safety, the problem are the Accidents, the incidents we see, the the serious one, you know, uh, crashes, fires, or or runway excursions, or or anything in between, or even less serious ones. And we have the classical definition of safety that safety is the freedom from from unacceptable risk. And therefore, when we talk about safety, we I think most of us immediately in on our minds will come an association or a picture of uh, something not working, uh, an accident, an incident. I mean, if I say safety, then what you think of is something that has been unsafe, strangely enough, not something that has been safe. Um, and so that's how we think about safety. That's how we define safety. That's how we measure safety. We measure safety by the number of things that have gone wrong. And we want to make sure that as little as possible goes wrong. So. So that comes back to the interesting discussion of, of what is safety. And I found a uh, one definition here from the American National Standards In Institute. I think ICAO has something similar. It says it's freedom from unacceptable risk. And I focus on two words there. One is unacceptable and the other one is risk. And if you then go through the dictionary, you see risk is a uh, uh, probability of a hazard related incident. So an a hazard is the potential for harm. And uh, unacceptable, well, it's, it's uh, the opposite of acceptable and acceptable we have in the ALARP principle as low as reasonably practicable, uh, uh, which actually means that uh, level of risk which can be further lowered only by an increase in resource expenditure that is disproportionate in relation to the results. So, so unacceptable actually means unaffordable. So what, I, what we get to is instead of this nice definition here, freedom from unacceptable risk, we actually mean freedom from unaffordable harm, harm that we cannot afford. afford. If we can afford it, we, we just accept it. So how do, how do we manage risk and how do we manage safety? Well, traditionally, we, we can think about safety as uh, as some, if you take this beaker analogy, then we're safe if it's empty, that corresponds to zero accidents or no accidents or no incidents. So the red, of course, indicates something that has gone wrong. And what we try to do whenever there's something has gone wrong, we try to figure out what it was, why it happened, how it happened. We try to remove it so that the beaker is empty. So we look for, for the causes of that we try to find the causes and we try to, to fix the causes. And, and uh, usually once we have fixed them, we, can, we think we can forget what we've been doing because now the problem has been fixed. So, so it's a common saying that the identification and measurements of adverse events is central to safety. So safety is a situation where we want to get away from something. So we have an unwanted situation, an unwanted event or, or risks or hazards, and we want to get away from them. And, and the problem with getting away from something is that any direction you take will take you away from it. So, and you know that way, if, you, if there's a fire and you run in panic, it doesn't matter in which direction you run as long as you get away from the fire. But that's not, re not really good if you want to manage safety. It shouldn't be a panic reaction 
trying to get away from something. It should be a, a deliberate action, trying to do something specifically. And, and that's why we sort of need to rethink what do we actually mean by safety? If, if we look at how we deal with safety in practice, then what we look at, what we do is, uh, and, and you all know that, we, we study the, the harmful events, the accidents, the incidents, and we analyze them and we try to understand why they happen. But what we're looking at is really the absence of safety. But what we're interested in, or what we should inter be interested in, is not the absence of safety, but the presence of safety, which you have up here. You can sort of see it in gray letters in the background. It's difficult to see, but the presence of safety is when you are above this limit of unacceptable performance. But that's not what we deal with when we deal with safety. We deal with the absence of safety. So, so one way of looking at it is to say, maybe we should look more at what happens up here in addition to looking at what happens down here. So don't only look at what happens when things go wrong, look at what happens when things go well as well. And the, the consequence of, of that is that we need to come to the conclusion that the problem is not safety in the sense that the problem is accidents and incidents. In fact, the problem is, well, the problem is in a sense, safety in the sense that nothing happens, but not safety in the conventional understanding. And I, I like a, a definition provided in, in 1987, so it's a few years ago, by Carl Weick, who said, safety is a dynamic non-event. It's an ongoing condition in which problems are momentarily under control due to compensating changes. So it's something we have to do continuously from moment to moment. We have to manage safety. We have to make sure that things go well. It's not enough to prevent things from failing. We have to make sure that they go well. And that, that puts a different perspective on, on safety and, and on what safety is and how we define safety. Uh, so what Weig also said, and, and I think this is quite important when we look at how safety has been practiced so far, is that what he called the non-events when things go well, they are invisible because they are constant and that means there's nothing to pay attention to. Everything is the same. And it, if everything is the same, we tend to disregard it because it's as it should be. And we don't notice it. We only notice things that are different. That's how our brains work. If something is different from what it should be, a sudden noise, a sudden change or something, we notice it even though we don't want to, but that, that we, our, our perceptual system works in that way. So I think what, what this, the upshot of this is for me that we should, learn to pay attention to the things that are normally invisible. We should learn to pay attention to when things go well, because if things go well, then we are safe. That almost, that's almost the definition of being safe. You can either say you're safe if things do not fail, but you could also say you're safe if something goes well. And, and to come back to the, the bigger analogy, then we simply twist it a bit and say, well, we are safe if it's full, if as much as possible and, and preferably everything goes well, then we're safe. And I've illustrated that by filling it with, with green, whatever, absinthe or whatever fluid you would like to put into it that has this color, or um, uh, mushy peas or whatever. Um, so we should try to make sure that as much as possible goes well. And to do that, we need to understand how things go well. So this becomes the next question. Instead of saying we need to understand how things fail, how accidents happen, we should say, no, no, we need to understand how things go well, because that is what we want. And of course, we know that something cannot go well and fail at the same time. So instead of tr trying to prevent it from fail, we can try to ensure that it goes well, because then we'll also achieve that a reduction in accidents, but we also achieve something else, more productivity, for, in, for instance. And, and when we looked at this, and people have been studying this now for 10, 15 years or so, we find that the acceptable outcomes that happen, the things that go well, 
happen because we individuals, organizations, and so on, are able to make approximate adjustments to the situations and handle and manage the situations that we are in. And the unacceptable outcomes happen for the very same reason. So we need to understand the reason why things go well, because that is also the reason why things sometimes don't go well. It's because the uh, adjustments are approximate, so we're missing something, but normally what we miss is of, of little significance, except when it combines in unexpected ways and where you, where you end up with unacceptable outcomes. So the, the uh, sort of the con consequence of that of the kind of thinking is to say, well, safety is not a question of avoiding something. It's a question of approaching something. Safety is the condition of being with intended and wanted outcomes, not being without unwanted outcomes. Uh, so we need to understand how we can be with them. And, and the nice thing about that, if you look at it from a problem solving perspective, is that if you're approaching something, there's only one way you can go. If you're trying to avoid something, any direction will do, it'll take you away from what one you want to avoid. But if you want to approach, it's much easier because you know in which direction you should be moving. It's much easier to do that. It's much easier to manage also. And, and we, if we look around, we see that we then actually try to manage not the absence of safety, but the presence of safety. And the presence of safety, I've illustrated here a lot of, of, of way we curse, which, in, which tries to indicate that what happens when things go well are many, many things that happen at the same time, and they are all adjusted to each other. They're all slightly variable. But the, but the variability is, is such that, that together it works. But every now and then, the, the variability is misaligned. The adjustments are misaligned. And then you have the, the unwanted outcomes. But we need to understand this because this is where we want to be. We want, to be, we want safety to be present. Uh, we don't want to avoid. Uh, we don't want to avoid accidents and incidents. But seeking the absence of safety is no good. We should seek the presence of safety. And, and if you look at what happens around you every day, then you can actually see that most things that happen through, through your life, not only through your work, but through everyday life, most things go well. In fact, nearly everything goes well, even, even during the pandemic. An amazing number of things go well, even though we change. We tend, as usual, to focus on the, on the things that don't go well. But most things actually go well, and we simply take them for granted. So we need to understand why do things go well. And when we do that and look into that, we can see, well, things go well because we there, there are sort of four characteristics or four abilities or four potentials, if you want to use that word, um, that we are able to respond in, in a flexible way when something happens. We're able to monitor what goes on, keep an eye on what's going on. We're able to learn from what works and from what doesn't. Not only learn from what, what, what fails, but also learn from what works. And we're able to look ahead, to anticipate, to try, not, to, try to see what is coming, what, what's ahead on the road, what's ahead on, on uh, so that we are prepared for or can prepare for that. So, the definition of what I'm saying is, is, is safety really enough? No, it, it's not because, well, it depends a little about what you mean by safety. I think that you can say safety is with something or without something. Usually we say safety is without accidents. But I'm sort of inspired by the World Health Organization, which says safety is a state of, of, of health, sorry, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So avoiding being ill is not the same as being healthy. And avoiding accidents is not the same as being safety. Safe, safety is something more than avoiding accidents. Safety is not being without something. Safety is being with something, is being with things that go well. So we, so we need to manage that. We need to manage whatever happens in an organization so that we achieve that state that as many things as possible go well. 
So managing safety is not managing to avoid accidents. Managing safety is managing to ensure that things go well, because if they do go well, they don't fail at the same time. So in order to manage something, it's fairly simple. We need to understand how it works. That, that's almost too obvious and to, to, to be worth mentioning, but we need to understand how something happens. If we understand that, we can find out what to do and when to do it. That is, we, can, we know how to respond. If we understand how something happens, what, what actually goes on, we know what to look for. We know which signals and which trends are important. That means we know to monitor. If you understand what goes on, we know what the relevant experience is, so we know how to learn. And if we understand what goes on, we also know what to keep in, our, in mind and be concerned about, so we know how to anticipate. So in order to manage safety, there are three things we need. We need to know where we are. I mean, and, and, and you, for those of you who, who, who fly or pilots, you know, this is, and for anybody who, who, who drives a car or whatever you do, you know, it's important. You need to know where you are. You need to know the current position. You need to know what happens around you at the moment where you are. You need to know where you want to be. You need to know the goal. Uh, you need to know when you are supposed to be there. And you need to know how to get there. You need to know how to make changes so that you can change from your current position to get closer to the goal. Now this goes for physical processes, flying, driving a car, walking, sailing, whatever. It goes for producing something, manufacturing something, improving quality. And it also goes for safety. But the problem is, as you know, with safety, we're not really sure what the position is if we count accidents only. We are, don't have a really clearly defined operational goal. If we just talk about zero accidents, that's not a good goal. It's not operational. And we are sort of at a loss about the means. What should we do to get closer to whatever goal we have from whatever position we have, if we know what the position is? And when we manage safety, and, and indeed, when we manage most things, we make free assumptions uh, without talking much about them. One assumption is that everything will go according to plans as we intended it to go. Second assumption is that conditions will be stable during the change. And the third assumption is that nothing else will happen other than what we plan to do. And you probably know from experience that all these assumptions are wrong. Nothing ever goes fully according to plans. Conditions will not be stable during the change we anticipate and something else will happen. And I think we can just refer to the pandemic to find plenty of examples of that. So coming back to when I started my question, why do I ask this question? Well, because when we manage something, when we manage how a system or a company or an organization or an airline or whatever it is, manage how it works, we need to manage safety but we all need to also need to manage productivity safety is i mean safety is not enough you need to have productivity you have to have resources you need to manage reliability so that it works reliably you need to manage quality you need probably need to manage other things as well and the question that sort of comes up is can we manage an organization by looking at these aspects in isolation don't we have to look at them together. And aren't they dependent? Aren't they coupled? Aren't they influencing each other? And, and sure they are. And this comes back to, to the question I had as a title, is safety really enough? And I think if we want to interpret safety as acceptably low risk of harms to persons and property damage, then my answer is no, that's not enough. It's not good enough. If safety is a condition where as much as possible goes well, which is sort of the, the, the was the first uh, version of the alternative, then it's maybe good enough. I'm not really sure. But if you say safety is a condition where performance as required, where performance is as required under both expected and unexpected conditions, then then that is what we want to do. And in that case, we need to manage the system as a whole not by parts, not by separate issues, 
safety is a part of system performance, but it's not all of system performance. And therefore, I humbly submit safety is not enough. Thank you very much for your listening to me and uh, over to you, James or Georgie, whoever is in charge. Many thanks, Eric. Um, inspirational and as thought provoking as, as, as always, really, really, really some fascinating stuff. And I think this concept of looking at the presence of, of stuff rather than focusing on, on, on the absence of bad things um, will be a theme that will be you know, coming coming back to time and time again throughout this this conference. So um, having wet your appetite, I think with what this is all about, it's now time to develop the theory a little bit further and set the direction for the rest of the conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to now introduce Dr. Stephen Shurrock. Stephen is the lead on safety culture systems thinking and safety too at Eurocontrol. He's also editor-in-chief of Eurocontrol's excellent Hindsight magazine. Now, for those unfamiliar with this publication, I thoroughly recommend you check it out. We've, we've included a link in the resources section um, of our safety conference website, and obviously you can access it via, via Eurocontrol. And it's a fabulous um, publication. Stephen is also adjunct associate professor at the Center for Human Factors and Socio-Technical Systems uh, within the, the University of the Sunshine Coast, Australia, and an honorary clinical tutor at the University of Edinburgh. He's also an invited member of ICO's Human Performance Task Force. The floor is yours, Stephen. Thank you very much, Georgie. I'll just load up my presentation and uh, thanks for the invitation um, to you all. Um, this talk will develop, I guess, for, for some of the themes um, that we've seen already from Eric, uh, so not surprisingly. And I will broaden out to systems thinking more generally. I won't uh, be talking all that much about safety, for partly really for the reason that Eric mentioned, that safety is one of, um, one of many goals. So, this talk um, is a sort of 30-minute uh, summary of a course that I present at Eurocontrol, our Institute for Air Navigation Services, um, called Systems Thinking. So this is a little crazy, if you like, of the course without all of the usual um, interaction. So I'll just talk first about what is systems thinking, because we have an idea about systems which is often quite different to the way that we use the term when we talk about systems thinking. Um, so excuse this first slide with lots of text, which is not all that usual for me, but I'm just going to outline 10 um, axioms or if you like kind of general laws or principles of systems thinking that might be useful to take us forward for the rest of this conference. So first of all, a system is a social, construct. Um, what does that mean? It means that a system is basically not an objective thing that's out there in the world. It's a subjective thing that exists within our minds. And that seems for this time of the day like quite a deep philosophical point. But what it means is a system is basically what we agree it to be. We often use the term system to describe something like um, a computer like this one sitting in front of me. Well, you could say that it's a system, but it's it's a system for what purpose? And where does the system end? Uh, and that's where the discussions start to get interesting. So a system is what we agree it to be. And that's the same for a system boundary. It's also the same for system purposes. And it's actually also the same for a cause. So the system boundary is what we agree it to be. The purpose of a system is what we want it to be. And a cause is what we negotiate, agree. It's not something that's out there in the world that's objective. The second thing is that systems have boundaries, um, which are not fixed and they're often permeable. But again, they're what we agree to be. And we've seen in this COVID crisis that several assumed system boundaries become quite flaky. Um, the boundary between health and mobility, for instance, uh, we see that this is a very permeable boundary and it's difficult to, for us to agree what the boundary actually is or should be. Um, systems also have multiple purposes. Um, and we, we, we often think of purpose from the wrong end, from the, um, from the designer's end, if you like. This is, if you like, the intended purpose. And a famous system theorist, uh, Stafford Beer, once um, said that, or he wrote many times, that, that the purpose of a system is what it does. 
Um, but I would add to that, the purpose of a system is what it does for you. Um, and that's important as well, because we all have different purposes from systems. We want to take something different from them. Um, a trivial example is that as I look out of the window in front of me, there's a bunch of trees in an old, old cemetery. Uh, now, the purpose of those trees for me is different to the purpose of the trees for the squirrels that my dog usually chases around the cemetery, for instance. And um, we, have, we just want different things from systems. So a system also does something that none of its parts, which are interconnected, can do. So it has, um, it has properties that none of its parts actually have. And Russell Ackoff often uh, used to make the point that, for instance, uh, uh, our brain doesn't think, uh, we think, and uh, our hand doesn't, doesn't write, we write. And in the joke, that an easy way to prove that was to chop off your hand and see what happens. Um, and it's not a good experiment, not recommended. But the point is that systems have to be seen in their whole and not from the behavior of their parts. And that's a point that Eric already made. Thirdly, influence and causation spread through a system. And in systems thinking, the idea of cause and effect is a lot more complicated and complex than it is in our everyday understanding of simple systems. When it comes to complex systems, such as the aviation system, the health system, it's difficult to think in terms of simple linear cause and effect. Systems also have a history, and Eric alluded to this point as well, that we often ignore that history, even though it has an ongoing influence on the system, that management decisions, government policies, regulations made sometime in the past are still having an effect now. There'll be different assumptions or imaginations about the system, such that we don't necessarily operate on the same assumptions of what a system that is that we're talking about. And these assumptions may not be documented well either. Number eight is that Understanding when it comes to system thinking requires synthesis, a holistic view, looking at how things interconnect and interrelate as wholes to produce a particular function. And not just by analysis, not just by breaking things down. So that's important, but we have to start with the whole. Number nine is that understanding can only ever be partial. Another thing that we, that we struggle to understand when we look back at when things have happened in the past, we often have the idea that we can develop a complete understanding when we will never fully understand things that we have happened in the past or even what's going on now. We will only really approach an understanding. And that gives us some sense of humility that we never really know what's going on or what has gone on. We have some indication, but we never fully know. A final system point is that there will be multiple perspectives on a system, and that's a strength, that we can see systems from different perspectives. Um, and that's something that we can acknowledge. There's no one true objective understanding of system behavior um, or, or system performance. So to move on from, from those points, there's a fundamental distinction in system thinking very often between what's often called complicated systems and um, complex systems. And this isn't a sharp line in the sand between the two, but complicated systems, we often think of mechanical systems, such as this jet engine that you can see on the screen. Uh, more complex system, well, is those very often that we find people engaged in actually the day-to-day -day operation, which is more or less everything. Also biological systems, for instance. Where these differ importantly is in all of these terms there in the middle of the screen, that if we just take an engine, for instance, the, the goal of an engine, let's say, is to produce thrust among other goals, but secondary goal. And that goal doesn't change over time. We can understand the engine, we can take it apart. Uh, well, some people could, I certainly couldn't. Um, we can understand the boundary of an engine, we know where it stops, and we can quantify every single part of the engine in some way. Um, the cause effect relationships are clear. It's stable over time, um, although it will deteriorate and, it, uh, and we can predict that also. Um, and it's also tractable or manageable. Now, those, those factors there in the middle apply to a much lesser extent for complex systems or human systems, socio-technical systems, because the goals change, for instance. We have different understandings of the system. We can't take it apart in any objective way. We can't quantify it very sensibly. Um, the boundary is often not clear. So that's just to make a few points. What's the implication? Why do I actually say that? Well, 
One implication is that we often treat complex socio-technical systems as if they were complicated machines. And we manage them in the same way very often by trying to quantify things, to quantify everything, um, by looking at things in a simple linear cause and effect way, by trying to take them apart and understand all of the component parts. But that doesn't make sense for a complex system. Here I draw a stakeholder map to one just to help get a sense of some of the complexity in terms of at least the number of actors in not just in the aviation system, but in transportation, in healthcare, in really any system. So um, this is a Balpa conference. So of course we have many probably pilots uh, attending and we have frontline actors, as, um, mechanical, um, operational and so on. Now, within the same organization, we have staff responsible for other functions that support those frontline functions, such as planning and safety and training, of course, and design and so on. As we move out of the organization on this stakeholder map, we have researchers in, in aviation, we have manufacturers, and we have regulators, all of which have some kind of an influence on the system, or they have some stake in the system in terms of understanding and intervening. And then outside of aviation, we have the media, we have government, we have the judiciary, um, we have the public, of course. And again, all of these have some kind of um, influence on the organizations and on the industry as a whole. Let's just look now at how things actually, um, how things happen. This is quite a common schematic that you'll see in system thinking. Um, Something like this, I've just adapted it, but at the top here we have outcomes, things that happen, usually things that grab our attention, and they may be safety related events, but they could be anything else, such as the ash cloud, um, you know, uh, crisis that, that um, kept many airplanes on the ground. Um, underneath those outcomes, we have patterns. By patterns, I mean patterns of work, patterns of information, patterns of interactions within the system, where we tend to do things in a similar way or things tend to happen in a similar way, creating patterns. Beneath the patterns, we have system structures. So here we have uh, the, 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 the organization as a structure and how that's structured. We have things like staffing, um, equipment, uh, procedures, policies, and all of the things that support an organization and uh, an industry. And these things create those work patterns to some degree. And at the bottom there, for want of a better term, we have mental models or shared ways of thinking, shared ways of understanding uh, the aviation system. Um, of course, there'll always be um, differences in our understanding, but we'll have some kind of shared mental models about how the aviation system works. And as you can see here, there's some kind of influence that goes up from um, mental models, up through system structures, creating patterns which, which, uh, from which outcomes emerge. And so there's some influence from the way that we think through to the way the organizations are designed and operate, through to the patterns of work and through to organ, uh, outcomes. Similarly, in the other direction, there is influence when it comes to um, out, when it comes to major outcomes. So the most obvious one at the moment is, of course, COVID, which um, has affected our patterns of mobility, uh, and those affect system structures such as staffing, sadly, as we know, and those affect the way that we think about the industry, the way that we think about mobility, the way that we think about health, the way that we think about safety. Now. A point here is that we can react and we tend to react to outcomes. The, the outcomes themselves, unwanted ones at least, are by definition quite hard to predict. But as Eric talked about earlier, we can observe um, patterns and we can, to some degree, we can anticipate patterns, um, patterns of work, patterns of information. We can design and manage system structures um, such as um, staffing, such as um, equipment and maintenance regimes and so on and procedures. Um, and we can influence mental models or ways of thinking. We can't manage how people think or design how people think, but we can at least influence them and that, that, that occurs. The point is, especially when it comes to safety, we tend to pay attention to outcomes, as Eric mentioned earlier, but not pay much attention to what goes on beneath 
through what what lies beneath what goes on in everyday work that we don't pay an awful lot of attention to partly because it just seems so ordinary just so mundane so normal that we don't realize that it, that actually there's so much to be learned from there at much less cost in many ways than waiting for very costly uh, unwanted unwanted events as we go deeper down the let's say iceberg these things become even harder to see so we we don't really understand that the way that we think when a major event happens our mental models are shifted quite dramatically and then we maybe pay attention to them a little bit more but ordinarily we don't pay attention to them it just seems like the normal way to um to think so how do we explain how uh things happen now this comes from a report from patient safety from really many many years ago by um uh, colleagues colleagues of ours richard cook david uh, woods and, his, his, uh, and their colleagues and um, they talk about two stories in patient safety, which applies to really any kind of sector. And the first story is about human error and component failure. When something goes wrong, when there's an unwanted outcome, this story appears very quickly after the event. It focuses on a short time period, uh, usually in the time frame of um, seconds or minutes. Um, but certainly a very short time period is, if you, if you like, what hits, the, what hits the news. It's very highly personalized, usually focused on frontline actors. And if you think to major accidents in the past, such as the train accident at Santiago de Compostela, you'll remember that in that short period after the accident, it was purely the driver that was in the, the, in the spotlight, highly personalized with a focus on components. If not the driver, then something perhaps mechanical, like the accident in 2013 in the same year at bretigny sur orge in, uh, in France, when there was a derailment there, where there was a focus on the points. This first story is low on context and low on complexity. We, we, we don't like complexity. It gives us some kind of anxiety to struggle with it. And the first story is, is low on those things, presenting um, something that seems like a simple, clear story. And for all of those reasons, it's very highly newsworthy. Um, it, the simple explanations satisfy some need for certainty within ourselves. And, and so these first stories tend to be highly newsworthy. Second story, on the other hand, is something different. If you like, it zooms out from the immediate stories about human error and, and, and component failure to vulnerabilities within the system. Um, this story emerges slowly, uh, usually after a, a long delay, um, and it focuses on a longer time period. And just to go back to the train accident in 2013 at Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain, th this second story took years to come out about how this accident happened in the way that it happened. And it was really very little about the driver anymore much lower personalization or else the number of people involved is so large that you can't focus on anyone exclusively instead of the parts being particularly important now it's the interactions that become important throughout the whole system the context becomes important and all of the complexity that that exists within that system um, and it's lower on newsworthiness again for all of those reasons because um, it's very difficult to explain a very very complex story and people have relatively little appetite for it this is a simple um, sort of um, set of questions that I often present when I'm doing doing training work especially with, um, with well with senior managers especially but with members of the judiciary as well and prosecutors um, when looking back at an unwanted outcome, whether it's safety related or otherwise, and people are uh, involved, um, these are three questions that are, that are useful to ask. Um, first of all, did design and management make it easier to do the right thing or to put it another way, easy to get it right? Did design and management make it hard to do the wrong thing or hard to get it wrong? And did it make design and management make it very hard to do something disastrous? 
And these are three questions that you will find in a forthcoming, um, forthcoming IKO manual on human performance. So look out on the website for that. I put them up because they're basically easy questions to remember, and therefore they're easy questions to ask uh, as a starting point for understanding um, when things go wrong or alternatively when things go right. I'll just move on now to how we understand human work um, more specifically, and I'll give another schematic that might be uh, might, that might be helpful to understand this. And if you've listened to Eric's talks before, and I'm sure you have, then he's talked many times about work as imagined, work as done. It's a distinction that goes back to French ergonomics in the 1950s, something something similar at least. Um, and we can think of many ways of thinking about work, but often when we think about work, we're not, we're not, we're not really considering the real thing. We are using what I call proxies for uh, human work. They're, they're kind of proxy ways of understanding or approaching an understanding of work, but we, they don't tell you about the real thing that's happened already in the past, usually. So we have work as imagined, which is what which is what we think other people do or what we think that we do, uh, what we think that we will do in the future. And that works in all directions. Um, it might be what uh, policymakers, regulators, senior managers, designers think a pilot does and, and vice versa. And both of those are uh, valid. And then we have work as prescribed or what the French ergonomist called uh, le travail prescrit. Um, these are the rules, regulations good practices, guidelines, checklists, and so on, that say, in a sense, how we, we should work. Um, we know, though, that if we work only, truly, 100% all the time according to work as prescribed, then things just don't work. We don't have su uh, sufficient efficiencies. And in fact, it, it's a form of industrial action called uh, work to rule or white stripe taken to its absolute extreme. And then we have work as disclosed, which is what, um, we say that we do. Um, it's often for many reasons, both very innocent and more motivated, not what we actually do. Um, we can't always remember what we actually did in the past for a first place, and we don't always want to disclose it. Um, but that's a, a, that's a source of insight that we get into work, but it's just a proxy. And then we have workers anal analyzed, which is what we do with all of our different um, interviews and our documents and so on that we analyze after, usually after things have gone wrong. And then when we make observations, as happened in the cockpit, as happens in air traffic control rooms, and as happens in competency checking and so on, we have workers observed, which are the impressions that we get from observing somebody else. Now, of course, we can't observe everything. We, we can't observe what goes on inside somebody else's head for a start and our eyes are, and brains are such that we can only observe one thing at a time in terms of our focus of attention and so while it looks like we're seeing actual work has done we're just actually seeing some aspects of behavior and context then we have work as simulated uh, which is quite close to work has done in a sense but it misses out very often some very crucial parts of real life um, real life work um, in my sector, for instance, uh, in air traffic management, it's, it's hard to simulate all of the interactions that you're gonna have with an airport as an air traffic control supervisor. It's hard to even simulate supervision in the same sort of way. And so many of the interesting things about work has done can't be simulated. Then we can move on to work as instructed or as trained. And uh, again, many air traffic controllers at least will say that you know, once you arrive on shift for your first duty as a as a licensed uh, air traffic controller with your ticket, then this is where the real training starts. And then we have workers measured. Uh, and very often, I think we we try to measure lots of things, but we end up measuring those things that are easiest to measure. They don't necessarily give us that much insight about the health of the system as a whole because we've chosen to measure fragments or parts of a system and not the functioning of the system as a whole. And then finally, we have workers judged, which is in a sense just workers imagined uh, about the, the current situation where we compare very often work rules, regulations, procedures, workers prescribed with what we understand of work has done through 
uh, our observations or through work as disclosed and so on. And so we form a judgment. And to add to that, there are many contexts of work has done without going through all of these. You can see through the COVID uh, crisis how every single one of these work contexts has been uh, affected by the COVID crisis in terms of aviation, in terms also of healthcare, that there have been implications for each of these um, contexts of human work, whether it's us personally, how our personal context has been changed. We're all mostly sitting from at home now, perhaps uh, watching this, um, you know, how our technological context has changed, how our access to and use of technologies has changed just in this conference even how the um, political context and the economic context and all of those have an influence on our, um, on our work has done. Just um, as I come towards the, uh, the end of this presentation, now I'm gonna talk about um, goals. And we have, um, if I go back, my apologies, we, we have different kinds of goals. Uh, one is what I'll call rhetoric. It's what we say, which is, I mean, we often say, for instance, safety first, that's a kind of rhetoric. And then there's the reality, which is simply how the system uh, functions in a sense. We also have goals that are more local to us, um, personally, or as departments or so on. And then we have goals that are more global, perhaps to a whole industry, perhaps to a society. Or, or, or so on. And so these are, this is um, a way of looking at goals. And I think what we should be more interested in is the, the goals of on the right hand side there, what's the reality of goals. And the reality is that we have to make lots of trade-offs in our work. Um, we have to make lots of goal trade-offs. And here I put five truths, if you like, about, about trade-offs because they're so important to understand human work. Um, to understand trade-offs between different goals, uh, between safety, security, uh, environment, cost efficiency, you know, capacity, and obviously now health as well. So trade-offs occur at all levels of systems, uh, while frontline operators such as pilots and um, engineers, technicians, air traffic controllers, and so on, make trade-offs on a second-by-second -second basis, minute-by-minute -minute basis. At the other end of the system, policymakers, regulators, um, and so on, are making trade-offs also, just over a different time scale. But the trade-offs trickle down through the system, and they also combine in unexpected ways. Um, but trade-offs are necessary for systems to work. We often use the word workaround as if it's a kind of dirty word. But if we look at trade-offs more generally, then the systems wouldn't work without them. The fifth point I'll make is that trade-offs require um, expertise. And in many ways, I would say that the ability to make trade-offs is uh, a, a very overlooked aspect of expertise. It's, it's not something often that you see as a competency clearly defined, but the ability to understand the system such that you can make trade-offs in an effective way, I think uh, is a real hallmark of expertise, but one that we don't pay that much attention to it. We kind of, we kind of take it for granted. To illustrate one of the points I made here, so the trade-offs occur at all levels of systems. So we have trade-offs at the level of government. And again, we're seeing this in the COVID crisis, that there's a trade-off between economy and, and health uh, for a start. And this is no easy trade-off to make, and it's much easier to look back and say that we got it wrong than to say at the time that we got it, that it's going right. Uh, there are trade-offs then at the regulatory and oversight level. There are trade-offs at company management level, local management level, and at the staff level, of course, as well. There's trade-offs throughout the whole system and they trickle down and they also come back up in some ways to have a, an influence at all levels of the system. Uh, pressure in particular creates this need to make trade-offs because we have different goals, we have limited uh, capacity, we have limited resources, we have a number of constraints, and so we just simply have to make trade-offs. We often don't pay that much attention to them, though, and we don't document them perhaps um, in the way that we the, the way that we could. And as a result of all of these trade-offs, we then have secondary trade-offs, unintended consequences, and so on. 
but through our ability to adjust and adapt on a day-to-day basis, things mostly go well, um, which seems surprising, but that's by and large a product of our ability to adjust and adapt at all levels of the system, that things mostly go well, but sometimes they don't. For this final section of the talk, then I'll just talk about, well, what can we do to understand and intervene, preferably uh, and do so uh, well as we would want to do. So this is a basic sequence of things that we should be doing, understanding and intervening, and then looking back at how our interventions have affected the system. Um, and usually, of short course, we should start with understanding, but very often we don't start with enough understanding. We're very quick to go in with an intervention. Um, it's what we like to do. We like to get things done and get things done quickly and get things done kind of efficiently without doing the groundwork of understanding, well, who are the people? Who are all of the stakeholders? What do they do? What tools do they use to do it? And uh, what are all of the contexts that I identified earlier? What are all of the contexts in which they work? All of that groundwork we often fail to do very well. And therefore, when we intervene, we are surprised, we have unintended consequences. Here's just some questions, um, just, just some questions that are um, asked by Russell Ackoff, a very uh, well-known systems theorist. Um, and he just said that this is the um, three point, if you like, um, way of looking at system thinking compared to more reductionist analytical thinking. So the first point is to identify a system boundary of which whatever you want to explain, whether it's an accident or whether it's a part of the operation or whether it's a particular activity or role. Um, so first of all, you look at the system boundary. Uh, that requires a discussion about, well, what is inside of our system boundary that we want, that we can un understand, that we want to understand, and what's outside of it, what's the environment? So that's a starting point for systems thinking. Who are the stakeholders that are within our system boundary? Now, very often that's not done or else not done effectively. And so we have surprises because there are things that go on outside of our system boundary that surprise us because we didn't take account of them in the first place. The second point that Akov makes is then we explain the behavior or the properties of that system or containing whole. So what are the properties of the system that we want to look at? We've decided the boundary, what are the properties of the system? What does it do? What are the essential properties that that system does that none of its parts can do? And then thirdly, then you go down to explain the behavior or properties of the thing to be explained. Again, it could be an event such as a some kind of incident, it could be some kind of function, some kind of role, some kind of activity, some kind of department, some kind of change program. But what are the behavior or properties of the thing to be explained within that system boundary? Now, very often we go the other way around, uh, or we don't even get to the system boundary because we stay very local um, at the level of explaining what the pilot did or did not do, what the controller did or did not do. Um, if you go to Skybury, many of you will have heard and used Skybury. I'm sure you will find a, a toolkit on there that's quite some years old now, from 2014, that I was involved in writing called System Thinking for Safety. You can read a bit more about some of the things, at least, that I've talked about today. So you'll find the toolkit there on Skybury. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. It's also in a printed white paper, um, you know, a kind of standard report. And it, it highlights these various things that I, if you just like useful things to know about when it comes to systems, I'm not going to go through here because you can read that in your own time. But as you go towards the bottom of that web page, you'll see some learning cards. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you can open these learning cards, which in a, I hope, easy to use way explains some of the basic concepts. Um, so here we have the first one on systems focus, which I've spent half an hour or so talking about. Um, and I think probably the most useful thing about these cards on the back, there's some practical advice about how to get started. So here, this card talks about the things I've already talked about. Who are the stakeholders? What are the purposes of the system? What is the boundary of the system? And how does it actually behave as a whole? 
And there's a whole bunch of cards in there. Well, there's um, about 11 to be precise because there's 10 principles plus that, that one, that foundation principle. Um, so I'll just start then, I'll finish rather with uh, just um, to let you know again about hindsight's been mentioned already, but if you want to get started on a practical level with understanding what organizations have done when it comes to some of these aspects of systems thinking and safety, um, safety two and so on, um, the last issue 31 was on learning from everyday work. You can find that on Skyberry, just Google hindsight. And the issues before were on well-being, goal conflicts and trade-offs, which I've spoken about in this talk on change, competency and expertise, safety of the interfaces, and work as imagined, work as done. Those are at least the last few, um, the, the last few issues, and all of those relate in, in many ways to what we're talking about over today and uh, tomorrow. And in here, you can see articles by frontline practitioners, um, primarily air traffic controllers and pilots. Um, by researchers, system scientists, um, safety specialists, human factor specialists, um, such as uh, Eric Holnagel and Richard Cook in the in, uh, in the previous issue, and myself and m many others. Uh, and we'll all, you'll also see articles from outside of aviation, from things like firefighting, from uh, healthcare, from even golf, sports psychology. If you're if you're into that, the next one will be on the theme of the new reality, and in the you'll see the call for articles in the inside back cover to hindsight issue 31. So that more or less wraps things up for me. And um, I hope that's been of some use. And um, if there's any questions later in the day, I'm, I may be able to address some of those as well. So with that, thanks a lot for your attention and back to you, uh, Georgie. Thank you, Stephen. Um, what an excellent foundation in system thinking that was. Really sets us up well for the rest of the conference. I thought the concept of a, of a system being a socio-technical construct um, is, is an important one to grasp. Um, very interesting also to hear about the two-story concept. And it makes me think, you know, what can we do as an industry you know, to ensure that the second story is genuinely sought out and listened to? Also pleased that you mentioned um, the notion of trade-offs uh, and the expertise involved in managing them effectively. Fantastic, thank you. As Stephen mentioned, just a reminder that you, if you do have any questions for, for him or for, for Eric um, earlier, um, then please submit them via the q and I've seen we've, we've got a couple already, so thank you. Uh, and we'll collate those for the, the panel session uh, at the end of the day. So moving on, having personally enjoyed several of his presentations, it's my privilege to now introduce Dr. John Holbrook uh, to give you a NASA research perspective. John is an aerospace research scientist in the Cruise Systems and Aviation Operations branch at NASA Langley Research Center. He's interested in the cognitive aspects of human performance um, in complex environments and the development of safe, high-performing human machine teams and organizations. His talk, amongst other stuff, will include space, um, cool space stuff, and it's the last one before the coffee break, so what's not to like? Over to you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Joji and James, um, and thanks also to uh, the British Airline Pilot Association for having me here today, um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate as part of this event. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, how we learn and about how the ways we think about safety can affect how we learn about safety. I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing, experiences we've been having here at NASA that I think will illustrate and hopefully reinforce some of the points that have been made by our previous speakers, Eric Holnagel and Stephen Shorrock. Um, now, because uh, I'm having to join uh, via the web interface in, uh, in Zoom rather than uh, through the Zoom app, uh, either uh, Joji or someone uh, else will be uh, displaying my slides, and I will uh, speak to them and uh, and provide cues for when to switch to the next slide. So hopefully uh, you're all seeing those now, and uh, if you can go on to the next slide. I'd like to begin with a few observations about how we as 
policymakers, as safety professionals, as researchers and developers, as frontline operators, uh, think about safety. Um, decision makers in aviation organizations want to make safety and want, want to make data informed decisions about safety management and system design. But we don't always consider the relationships among safety thinking, data collection, learning, and safety policy. As I try to illustrate in this simple diagram, how we think about safety determines the safety data we choose to collect and how we analyze those data. The outcomes of those analyses dictate what we learn from those safety data, and what we learn informs our safety policies and safety-related decision-making. These policies and decisions further reinforce or refine our safety thinking. Next slide, please. Eric has used the term safety one and safety two to describe two ways that we think about safety. Safety one refers to a view of systems performance in which things go right because the system is functioning as it should and things go wrong when something in the system is malfunctioned or failed. The goal of safety one thinking is preventing or eliminating those things that can go wrong. Safety two, on the other hand, is predicated on the concept that in complex systems, things often go right because people continuously adjust their work practices to match their operating conditions. Thus, understanding safety requires developing an understanding of everyday activities. The goal of safety two thinking is ensuring that as many things as possible go right. In complex systems like commercial aviation, each of these views of safety contributes to the overall safety of the system. That is, sometimes things go wrong, but thankfully, most of the time, things go right. Thus, safety two should not be viewed as an alternative to safety one, but as a complementary way of thinking about safety. That is, safety one and safety two thinking lead us to consider different safety data. Traditionally, however, safety one thinking has been and remains far more prevalent in most operational domains, including aviation. But why is this significant? Well, first, we need to keep in mind that humans play an integral role in aviation safety. Therefore, human performance represents a significant source of aviation safety data. Second, we need to recognize that human performance includes both desired and undesired actions. Most of the time, those actions promote safety, but sometimes those actions can reduce safety. However, when our safety thinking systematically restricts the data we collect and analyze, this restricts our opportunities to learn from human performance. Importantly, when this restriction is systematic, it can bias what we learn, which can in turn affect our safety policies and decision making. Next slide, please. People learn from a broader range of experiences than is often appreciated. Sometimes this learning is explicit, declarative, open to later recollection and reflection. Sometimes this learning is implicit, procedural, not open to conscious recall, but it still affects how we behave and perform. Learning doesn't just occur during deliberate practice or training, and it doesn't just occur when we're on the clock between releasing and setting the parking brake. Learning doesn't just occur when things go wrong, and it doesn't just occur when things go right. Indeed, learning can be thought of as a consequence of interactions between people and their environments. Organizations are human-created systems that don't automatically have the properties of the humans that comprise them. So when we talk about organizational behavior, we're typically referring to human behavior in an organizational setting. That is, people behave, organizations don't behave, but organizations do affect human behavior in important ways. Likewise, when we talk about organizational learning, we're talking about human learning in an organizational setting. When we talk about individual learning, we're typically referring to the processes of creating and retaining knowledge. Organizational learning adds the process of transferring knowledge across individuals and focuses on how the properties of the organization will affect all three of these processes. That is, how does an organization affect opportunities to create, retain, and transfer knowledge? Next slide, please. I've listed here some of the factors that are known to improve an individual's encoding and retrieval of information. We can think of these factors not only in terms of the individual, but in terms of what organizations do to create or hinder opportunities for these factors to be present. Many organizational policy decisions are intended to support learning. In other cases, policy decisions made to provide some benefit to the organization can have unintended negative consequences on learning by influencing some of these factors. Uh, this relates to some of the uh, the trade-offs that uh, Stephen was speaking about. What messages is the organization communicating to its workers, not just through its words, but by the impacts of its policies on everyday work? Individuals who are motivated to learn typically learn better than those who aren't. What are ways in which your organization's policies and decisions influence the motivation and morale of its workers? What kinds of individual behaviors are noticed, rewarded, and reinforced by the organization? Do, indi do individuals feel like their actions have an impact? 
Much of what we learn builds on what we already know. Learning is facilitated by creating meaningful associations between new experiences and existing knowledge, and in helping us recognize when a new experience is inconsistent with previous experience. Does the organization create opportunities not only to provide for a breadth of individual experiences, but also opportunities to learn from others' experiences? Learning is reinforced through rehearsal and practice. Does the organization provide sufficient opportunities to practice what's being learned? Elaborating in our experiences also helps consolidate learning. For example, writing or talking about our experiences. Does the organization provide and encourage opportunities for individuals to write about or talk about their experiences? These opportunities can be formal or informal and incidentally create opportunities for sharing knowledge with others, thus benefiting both the person sharing their experience and the recipients. As a word of caution, organizations should certainly, certainly encourage, but be careful not to over mandate the elaboration of experiences to the point that it becomes onerous. If the documentation of experience process becomes too burdensome, this can inadvertently discourage workers from elaborating an experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Spacing out your practice also helps consolidate what you've learned. A lot of this consolidation, the building and strengthening of associations in your memory that help you remember, happen between learning episodes. This is particularly true for building fluency with procedural knowledge, helping task performance become more fluid and less effortful. I would note that sleeping is a special case of this. Research shows that not only does memory consolidation happen in the space between learning episodes, but a great deal of memory consolidation happens while we're asleep. This is one of the many reasons why sleep is so important. So we should also consider how organizational policies and schedules can support or hinder opportunities for sleeping, because it's an important factor in learning. I hope these examples illustrate how organizations can, intentionally or unintentionally, be enablers or obstacles to learning. What I'd like to encourage is identifying ways in which organizational policymakers can be more mindful about how their decisions and policies impact learning. If your organization is anything like NASA, then data are indispensable to creating this mindfulness. That is, one of the best ways to ensure that organizational policymakers pay attention to something is to show them some data about it. I'll spend the remainder of my briefing talking about data and how we can use data to facilitate the creation, retention, and transfer of knowledge, particularly about people's safety-producing behaviors. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned, our safety thinking affects the data we choose to collect and analyze. Our data analysis informs what lessons we learn from what's happened, and our learning informs our safety design and policy decisions. This is important because we want those decisions to be data informed. But what are the consequences of focusing our data collection only on what happens during rare failure events? When we do that, we're focusing on a small, non-representative sample of system performance. When we restrict our learning to infrequent events, we restrict opportunities to learn and limit how quickly we learn. But more importantly, learning only from a non-representative sample of data introduces sampling bias. It can result in erroneously attributing what was learned from the sample to the larger population. So let's look at a real world example of this kind of sampling bias in action. Next slide, please. While virtually everyone accepts, A, that safety producing behaviors outnumber human errors in aviation, and B, that most of our learning comes from studying errors and failures, the magnitude of this discrepancy is often difficult to grasp without some data. Even a few data points, however, can be useful to illustrate this point. Numerous sources, of doc, uh, numerous sources have documented that human error has been implicated in 70 to 80% of aviation accidents. Remember, however, that human performance includes both desired and undesired actions, actions that promote safety as well as actions that can reduce safety. Indeed, the Performance-Based Operations Aviation Rulemaking Committee's Commercial Aviation Safety Team reported, based on an analysis of line operational safety audit data, that pilots intervene to manage aircraft malfunctions on 20% of normal flights. If we look at those percentages within the context of 10 years of worldwide jet data, courtesy of Boeing, we can construct a contingency table of outcome, not accident or accident, by whether human intervention was identified as being associated with that outcome. I would note that human interventions on 20% of normal flights is very likely to be a significant underestimate, as these data refer only to the specific case of pilot interventions associated with aircraft malfunctions. There are lots of other reasons that pilots might intervene to manage a normal flight, but even with this underestimate, we can clearly see that when we only analyze data from errors and failures, we're ignoring the vast majority of human impacts on system performance. As we reflect on our safety thinking, we should consider how much are we investing in the various cells in this table 
and whether such investments are proportional to what we could learn. By investing exclusively in the cell circled in green, not only is this a significant missed opportunity to learn from instances of success circled in red, but focusing only on results from errors and failures that are obviously not representative of human performance can lead to overgeneralization of those results. Namely, human error shows up so frequently in the sample we're studying, we erroneously conclude that these errors are representative of overall human performance, that human behavior thus has a net negative effect on system safety. Next slide, please. So now that everyone's hopefully on board with why safety two thinking is so important, how do we actually go about collecting and analyzing data on operator safety producing performance? I've identified here some of the questions we need to ask, including what data are currently available and from what sources, including operator, observer, and system generated data. For the reasons that Stephen described so well, it's very important to look at multiple sources of data, each of which provide different perspectives on what happens. Operators can provide insights into their own motivations for their behaviors. Observers can notice behaviors that operators may dismiss. Systems can capture quantitative aspects of data. No single source is a silver bullet, but each can contribute to our understanding of performance. How and why are data analyzed? What's already being done with data that are collected? Are there new analysis opportunities, new ways to interpret existing analyses? What data could be collected but aren't? There may be some low-hanging fruit here that can be identified simply by changing how we think about safety. How can we measure the productive safety capability of a system? How do operators prevent, prepare for, and recover from failure? How do operators create and leverage safety building opportunities? How do organizations support or hinder exercising these capabilities? Uh, so I'm not going to, uh, before you get too excited, going to answer all of those questions in this presentation. Um, but I am uh, on the following slides going to go a little deeper into various sources of data and briefly touch on uh, some of the completed and ongoing work here at NASA to begin to address some of these questions. And I'll be happy to follow up offline uh, or later in the discussion with anyone who'd like to learn more about uh, what we've done and what we're working on. Uh, next slide, please. So operator generated data can include interviews, questionnaires, and event self reports basically any data provided directly by an operator about their own lived experience. At NASA, we've conducted interviews based on Gary Klein's critical decision method, in which we asked pilots and controllers to tell us about a specific unplanned or unexpected event experienced during recent routine operations. We've also conducted an analysis of operator self-reports filed with NASA's aviation safety reporting system, describing our NAV arrivals into Charlotte Douglas International Airport. What I'm showing here is an example of one representative event report from ASRS to illustrate that these narratives can be a source of data on both undesired and desired performance. I won't take the time to read through the entire narrative here, but simply wanted to highlight that these narratives can provide evidence of undesired behaviors and conditions, such as loss of situation awareness, distraction, and high workload, as well as desired behaviors and conditions, such as monitoring for unexpected states, awareness of one's own internal state, adaptive task reprioritization to compensate for workload constraints, etc. One of the things that surprised us uh, was learning that even reports filed explicitly for the purpose of describing something that went wrong can be a useful source of data on things that went right. Next slide, please. Observer-generated data includes data from observations of line operations as well as training and simulator observation. In rich and complex environments like aircraft flight decks, not every behavior is realistically observable. There's simply too much going on and not every action is meaningful to capture. So we use knowledge frameworks to train and prepare observers for what to focus on. These knowledge frameworks can be thought of as one way of embodying safety thinking. At NASA, we're interested in exploring how different knowledge frameworks can provide different insights into operators' uh, safety-related behaviors. That is, how does the knowledge framework of an observer affect the insights they derive from an observation. There are some well-established knowledge frameworks such as threat and error management, which is the basis for LOSA, line operational safety audits. Threat and error management, uh, as with many operationally relevant constructs, doesn't reflect purely safety one or safety two thinking, but it has some elements of both. However, threats and errors, undesired states and behaviors are the primary unit of analysis. American Airlines has developed a knowledge framework for flight line observations more explicitly uh, inspired by safety two thinking. Their learning and improvement team framework isn't a replacement for LOSA, but a complementary data collection 
another way uh, to learn about human performance from observation built around observable behaviors associated with planning, coordinating, adapting, and learning. Tune in tomorrow to learn more about this approach from uh, American Airlines. I think that's one of the uh, talks scheduled in tomorrow's session. Uh, next slide, please. System-generated data includes everything from flight data records to documentation. As part of our exploration of learning from system-generated data, NASA has looked into repurposing an algorithm designed to detect adverse event precursors to explore preventative crew behaviors in flight operations quality assurance or FOQA data. We reasoned that these preventative safety behaviors might manifest in objective aircraft flight data as the pilot taking action to preempt an anticipated adverse state. These preemptive actions were identified using a machine learning algorithm designed to detect precursor states that have a high probability of predicting a known adverse event. The adverse event used in this example was a high-speed exceedance at 1,000 feet. A sample of 500 adverse event flights and 500 non-event flights were analyzed. Adverse event flights were analyzed to characterize uh, those events based on 60 recorded variables, and non-event flights were then examined for high precursor probabilities. An example of a non-event flight that exhibited a high precursor probability followed by the lowering of that probability is shown in the graphs. The x-axis in each plot is the distance in nautical miles from the point at which the aircraft reaches 1,000 feet of altitude. The solid blue line is the time series trace for each of the selected parameters uh, that describe the precursor. In this example, we've graphed vertical speed in plot one, computed airspeed in plot two, and altitude in plot three. The black dotted lines indicate the 10th and 90th percentiles of the non-event data for each parameter. Plot four shows the computed precursor score for each sample in the time series. Samples for which the precursor score was greater than 0.5 are marked with red dots in plots one, two, and three, and are considered high probability precursors of a high-speed exceedance at the end of the time series. The shaded green region in the, in the precursor plot score, uh, plot four, uh, represents the event of interest in which a degraded state was identified and potential for a preemptive action was indicated. So to unpack this a little bit more, in plot one, the descent rate inferred from vertical speed was significantly faster than the typical pattern at that point in the flight. Simultaneously in plot two, we see that airspeed was trending upward toward the upper bound of the normal distribution. At this point, the pilot slowed the aircraft descent rate and the airspeed began to stabilize. Although the airspeed remained outside the typical range, the transfer of the aircraft's energy from altitude to airspeed reduced the probability of a high-speed exceedance adverse event. When aircraft energy is converted from altitude to speed, more tools are available to the pilot to reduce kinetic energy, for, uh, for instance, through the use of speed brakes, deploying flaps, etc. This scenario shows a situation in which a flight reached a state with an elevated probability of leading to an adverse event but actions were taken in time to reduce this probability and the adverse event, high-speed exceedance at 1,000 feet, didn't occur. What's particularly significant here is that we've identified one possible approach for analyzing and learning from normal flights. Typically, flight data from flights such as this one that fall into the non-event category would never be analyzed because in the safety one thinking that pervades how we approach data, we would only target for analysis event flights that contained an undesired state, the high-speed exceedance at 1,000 feet. A potential benefit that I hope this example illustrates is that we don't have to wait for bad things to happen before we learn. Next slide, please. Sometimes, however, bad things do happen or come very close to happening. These are the kinds of events that our organizations do tend to invest as, in as learning opportunities. But even in these cases, how we think about safety affects the questions we ask, the data we collect, and our opportunities to learn from what happened. Because mishaps are rare, they're often viewed as exceptions very unlike the everyday work that routinely results in safe and successful outcomes. However, as Stevens pointed out in one of his recent uh, hindsight articles, sometimes extraordinary events can be symptoms of failure to learn from everyday work. I'm going to talk about an extraordinary event that happened at NASA back in 2013 as an illustration of this. In a nutshell, an astronaut aboard the International Space Station, or ISS, nearly died during a routine spacewalk, known in NASA parlance as an extravehicular activity or EVA. NASA took this close call very seriously and conducted a thorough mishap investigation. Similarities were noticed between some of the findings from this mishap and prior high-profile high NASA mishaps, including the Challenger and Columbia shuttle accidents. This prompted the chairman of the Mishap Investigation Board, Chris Hansen, 
to ask a very important question. Why do we keep having these tragedies and not learning the lessons they're teaching us? We'll return to this question later, but first let's talk a bit more about the events surrounding the CVA. Next slide, please. On July 16th, 2013, two crew members were performing planned maintenance tasks outside of the ISS during extravehicular activity number 23. 38 minutes into the EVA, one of the crew members' carbon dioxide sensor failed. This was immediately detected by the astronaut and by the large staff of support personnel on the ground monitoring the EVA. However, carbon dioxide sensor failures aren't uncommon during EVAs, as condensation builds up in the astronaut's helmet over time, interfering with the sensor. So while this event was noted, it was not given much significance. 43 minutes into the EVA, the same crew member, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano, reported water inside of his helmet at the back of his head. Luca was unable to identify the source of the water. Over the next 23 minutes, as the astronauts continued their work, various discussions took place, both with the astronauts and among people on the ground, focused on identifying the source of the water and whether the amount of water was changing. Most of the speculation about the source of the water focused on the drink bag that astronauts wear on their chests during spacewalks. EVAs can last up to six or seven hours, and astronauts are provided with a drink bag with a bite valve so they can stay hydrated during their time outside the station. These drink bags have been to, known to leak water into the helmet, and indeed, when water was discovered in Luca's helmet during his first spacewalk, EVA 22, which had taken place one week before, it was attributed, to the, uh, attributed by the crew to a leaky, leaky drink bag. Now back to the events of EVA 23. When Luca reported that there was a lot of water and that it was definitely increasing, uh, as a precaution, the decision was made to terminate the EVA. Luca was asked to return to the airlock while his EVA partner, fellow astronaut Chris Cassidy, cleaned up the work site and then made his own way back to the airlock. To avoid tangling of tether lines which connect the astronauts to the station, each astronaut uh, routinely takes a different path to navigate between the work site and the airlock. As Luca started making his way back to the airlock, several things happened. First, as Luca turned his body as he navigated around the outside of the ISS, the water at the back of his head didn't turn with him, and it migrated from the back of his head to his face. On its way, the water temporarily shorted out Luca's communication system and then settled over his eyes, nose, and mouth. Luca was cut off from talking with anyone, couldn't see, and was struggling to breathe while floating outside of the space station. Although he was disoriented, he was able to follow his tether back to the airlock. From the time the EVA was terminated, no one checked on Luca for over 20 minutes. Eventually, someone on the ground asked, how's Luca doing? When the ground tried to reach him, Luca was unable to respond due to the water-induced failure of his communication system. When Luca failed to respond, this was the first time that everyone realized the seriousness of the event that Luca could be in danger. Fortunately, his EVA partner was arriving at the airlock at about the same time, was able to perform a visual check on Luca and get Luca to respond to squeezing his hand. Within minutes, the crew on board the station worked to repressurize the airlock, bring Luca into the station and remove his helmet. The subsequent mishap investigation ultimately determined that the source of the water in the astronaut's helmet wasn't from the drink bag, but was due to contaminants uh, in the water in the primary life support system. The contaminants blocked a filter in the water circulation system, causing the water to back up and flow into the astronaut's helmet. The MIB also noted that the presence of water in the helmet had been normalized. Water entering the helmet had been observed in the past and over time had become accepted as normal, as normal suit behavior. This normalization resulted in missed signals of the seriousness of the event, which led to delays in recognition and response. Next slide, please. So a redacted copy of the Mishap Investigation Board's report is available for download at the address at the bottom of this slide, but I wanted to highlight a few of the findings from that report. Crew member training didn't include this failure mode, what to do when your helmet starts to fill with water. There was no flight rule telling the ground personnel how to address this failure mode. The spacesuit hazard report didn't identify this hazard. It was well known in the ISS community that drink bags leaked. Minor amounts of water in the helmet were normalized. 
The flight control team on the ground accepted the explanation that the water discovered in Lucas' helmet during the previous spacewalk, EVA-22, was from the drink bag. The ground team allowed time pressures of the impending EVA to influence their actions. The International Space Station operates on a very tight and tightly coupled schedule in which even minor delays can cause significant ripple effects. The ISS program conducted EVA-23 without recognizing the suit failure that occurred previously on EVA-22. The flight control team's perception of the anomaly reporting process as being resource intensive made them reluctant to invoke it. Next slide, please. These findings from the mishap board highlight missed opportunities by NASA to anticipate, monitor for, respond to, and learn from what happened during the EVA. No one anticipated that a failure of the water pump in the primary life support system could pose a safety threat to an astronaut. Opportunities to monitor were missed. No one fully recognized the significance of the cues that were encountered. Opportunities to respond were missed. Effective adjustments weren't made based on previous circumstances and pressures. And opportunities to learn were missed. The water in the helmet that was reported on the previous EVA was never investigated. A simple test of the drink bag from EVA 22 would have shown that the drink bag didn't leak and couldn't have been the source of the water. This anomaly in EVA 22 wasn't recorded in the ISS anomaly reporting system, which is viewed as onerous, disincentivizing people from invoking the process. Without data, learning doesn't happen and informed decisions can't be made. Next slide, please. But what else can we learn beyond the findings of the mishap board, both from the processes by which NASA investigated this mishap, as well as by focusing our learning only on exceptional events? Reliance on prediction and prevention left ISS vulnerable when responding to unexpected events. No training focused on recognition and dealing with uncertainty. The ISS program has invested very heavily in predicting what can go wrong and developing procedures for what to do when that failure happens. This can be a very effective strategy when the failure that occurs matches well with the failure that was predicted. However, sometimes failures occur that weren't predicted. Follow-up analysis showed that training for astronauts and ground personnel focused on how to respond to an identified failure, but not on decision-making under uncertainty. That is, the team wasn't prepared for an event that hadn't been predicted, and past success and prediction had led to a belief that everything that could go wrong had already been identified, and there was a plan for it. Weak signals of the impending problem were present during everyday work, but were insufficiently understood. There were several signals that were ignored during the everyday work leading up to this event, and by everyday work, I mean events that had routinely successful outcomes. For example, if you recall, I mentioned that the carbon dioxide sensor failed 38 minutes into EVA 23, and that these sensor failures were not uncommon. However, in every past instance, these sensor failures had occurred late in an EVA, after many hours, never after only 38 minutes. But because these sensor failures had recurred during everyday successful events, they weren't well investigated nor well understood. We knew why they occurred, but the fact that there was enough water in the sensor to cause a failure after only 38 minutes was discounted. Unintended, unrecognized pressures can lead to reluctance to speak up. Astronauts want to go on spacewalks. It's really the pinnacle of an astronaut's career and not something they would want to jeopardize. Luca deserves a lot of credit for speaking up about the water in his helmet, despite knowing that doing so might result in termination or a board of his EVA. In addition, the ISS program does an excellent job of providing stated policies about the importance of speaking up. The program encourages its employees to speak up, particularly about safety concerns. However, despite this, some ground personnel still reported reluctance to speak up if they felt like either speaking up wouldn't make a difference or if it would set off a chain of events that would create conflicts with the flight schedule especially if the issue was probably nothing. Focusing on error chains in mishap investigations limited learning. Numerous desired behaviors, both by astronauts and by people on the ground, occurred before, during, and in the aftermath of the EVA-23 EVA close call, but none of the mishap board's recommendations were tied to these desired behaviors. For example, the ground crew did an excellent job of querying Luca about the change in the amount of water leading up to the decision to terminate. Astronaut Chris Cassidy did an excellent job of establishing nonverbal communication with Luca once it was discovered that his comm system had malfunctioned. These are often valuable but largely undocumented instances of things going right, even during mishap events. Overlooked lessons, which could be the difference between a routine event and a close call, or between a close call and a tragedy. 
To return to the question asked by the Mishap Investigation Board Chairman, why do we keep having these tragedies and not learning the lessons they're teaching us? I would propose that making changes in our safety thinking could lead to asking new questions and learning new answers. Perhaps we haven't been learning those lessons because we've limited our learning to rare extraordinary events and neglected opportunities to learn from the full breadth of everyday performance. Next slide, please. So in summary, I think it's important for us to recognize that individuals are almost always learning and the organizations of which we're a part can affect the creation, retention and transfer of knowledge. To that end, when data are collected and analyzed by an organization, uh, when, uh, sorry, to that end, which data are collected and analyzed by an organization are informed by how people in that organization think about safety. How people think about safety informs the data they collect and analyze, and in turn, the policies, procedures, and practices of that organization. Policy decisions that are based only on failure data are based on a non-representative sample of human performance and can thus be misleading while having the appearance of authority by virtue of being data-driven. Fortunately, many opportunities exist to collect and analyze the largely unexploited data on operator, observer, and system-generated data on desired safety-producing behaviors. Identifying, collecting, and interpreting data on operators' everyday safety producing behaviors can help us have the conversations about how a system performs, not just how it fails. This is critical for building a more integrated and representative safety picture. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. I hope I managed to say some things that were uh, useful or at least interesting, and I'd be happy to follow up with anyone who has questions or topics for discussion in the uh, later Q&A. Thank you, John. What a fascinating presentation. Absolutely. It's just, just had me riveted there. Um, really interesting to, to see the, the use and applications of data, um, real life data to illustrate both uh, the reasons for, for doing this approach, but also illustrating how it can, can work in our favor, but also um, nothing like a, a, a tangible example to, to sort of ram home the message as well. So we've come, um, to the end of the first session. We're running a little bit ahead of, uh, of time at the moment, so we're going to take the break now. Um, what we need to do is actually log out of this session, so we'll end this, this Zoom session, uh, and then we'll restart a, a new session two. Um, so you'll, you'll need to use your session two link um, to, to get back into the conference. So it's now um, 20 to 3 UK time. If you can be ready to rejoin the conference at 3 p.m., so that's 3 p.m. UK time, using your session two link, um, and then we'll, we'll commence then. So enjoy your, enjoy your coffee and see you back again at 3 p.m. for session two. Thank you. So Joji, just a second, was that 3.15 you meant? I thought we can bring it bring it forward 15. Right. Okay. We are, we are a, bit ahead of, a bit ahead of schedule, so um, yeah. 15 minutes earlier. Good. James. Okay.